Thank you so much. <clears throat> wow, I enjoyed that worship today, didn't you? It was like a glory spa. <laughs> Anybody else getting that? My goodness. Thank you, worship team. That was, that was powerful. Oh, it's so good to be with you. I'm going to just uh, make you aware of some of the resources we have. I haven't written how many? A hundred and what? A hundred and eight books. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I, I'm thinking I'm at 30 maybe right now, 31 or 32. So when I grow up... <laughs> All right, so uh, this book, Love and Prophecy, was actually born out of the first Voice of the Prophets that I spoke at. The Lord said, hey, don't take any of your notes into the pulpit. Just trust me. And uh, this is the message that came out, how 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter is not just about um, how we do relationships. It's actually about how we do spiritual gifts. It's the ultimate prophetic protocol. I love what George Washington Carver said. He said, if you love anything enough, it'll share its secrets with you. You know, I believe in 1 Corinthians 12, where it says, uh, the final verse of 1 Corinthians 12, it spends the whole chapter talking about how we all have different gifts. But in the last verse, it says, but earnestly desire greater gifts, and let me show you the more excellent way. I don't believe he was doing comparison and contrast. I believe that love is the pathway to the greater gifts. And so uh, this book really just breaks down those 14 principles of love and how they apply to building prophetic community. So Mike, would you uh, give this away for me? You can just use your discernment on that. Hey, this is a really fun book. I might speak about this here uh, at Life Center Sunday morning. We'll, we'll kind of see how that goes. But uh, it's called Bending Time. What happened to me is I traveled two weeks a month for 20 years, uh, mostly international. I'd leave on a Monday, and I'd arrive on a Wednesday, and there was no Tuesday. Um, and that would happen over and over again to where... I ended up losing eight months of Tuesdays in, in 10 years. It's why I look younger than I am. It's like, but uh, I found the secret. But the, uh, I realized that time is not this, this hard thing that can't be moved. It's actually a flexible fabric. That time is a perception of duration relative to your awareness of the kingdom of God. You can actually, when you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, you're, seating, you're seated above the dominion of time. Time was not created to rule you, but to serve you. It was created to mark times and occasions and seasons for you, not to master you. And every time you say, I don't have enough time, you're making time your master rather than your friend. And so uh, we go through principles of how to redeem time, how to bend the fabric of time for increased productivity in particular. So Mike, go ahead and lay that on somebody. <laughs> this is my newest book uh, I co-wrote with our co-founder, Bethany Hicks, powerful uh, lady prophet. Um, it's called The Power in a Name. We believe the name, your name contains the roadmap uh, it, it contains the, uh, the treasure map to your identity and the roadmap to your destiny. That God's actually encoded your name with uh, prophetic revelation. And uh, this really unpacks that for you. So again, thank you, Mike. You're such a good catch too. That's awesome. I love that. Okay, and uh, this book, uh, The Good Fight Prophetic Processing Manual, this is for what to do with all your prophetic words. And I walked around with my prophetic words in a notebook. I had 54 prophetic words that I walked around with. I prayed them. I declared them uh, for 10 years and wasn't seeing any of them come true because I didn't know how to recognize the accelerance of partnership. And as soon as I saw the accelerance of partnership and conditions and commands, I, in the next few years, I saw every one of those prophetic words come true. And so this really contains 
that how to fight the good fight with your prophetic words through prophetic processing. So, <laughs> all righty, thank you. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, I, I love the honor of being at this event, and uh, I do feel honored. I, I, I love Randy and the ministry here and this community that is so committed to spirit and in truth. And uh, one of the things that I love about this ministry is, is the equipping aspect of it. I think it's so important that, you know, in the early days, Randy, I think in 98, wrote the book, you know, God Can Use Little Old Me. And there were apostles that had gone before, but the apostolic focus on equipping, of saying, hey, you can do signs and wonders and miracles, that was a revolution and a reformation that is continuing in this community today. And uh, I want to speak into that a little bit this morning in regards to prophetic maturity. Uh, I, I, that, I, <laughs> that's just kind of a sobering word. As soon as you say maturity, people are like, oh, it's morning session and we're going there. But Haley kind of started a little bit on this yesterday uh, and it was beautiful. It was powerful. But I, I want to share kind of what this feels like, you know. When you start getting known as a prophet, people come up to you and they go, will you pray for me? <laughs> like all the time, like, will you pray for me? And they don't mean prayer. They want a prophecy. Even I'm doing a book signing later and people go, will you sign my book? I'm like, is it a digital book? What's, what's going on here? You... <laughs> and, and, and people are always like, hey, prophet, tell us what's going to happen. No, seriously, I, I, one of my favorite comedians is Brian Regan. Uh, <laughs> yep, I, you like him too. He was kind of one of the forerunners of clean comedy and family level comedy. And, but, but, you know, he said, okay, okay, funny man, start cracking some jokes. And that's what it feels a little bit like being a prophet nowadays as you step up and people are like, okay, prophet man, start telling me what's going to happen. And uh, it's time to get over that. And, and I want to share with you what I believe is the Father's heart for prophetic maturity. You know, the goal of all fivefold gifts is the equipping of the saints, the highest expression of the fivefold ministry is the equipping of the saints to maturity. <laughs> and it, it, it's funny because people keep trying to make the distinction between prophets and prophets. And they're like, well, prophets can prophesy on this level and they can do this and this. And you know, there's some truth to some of what they say, but most of them are just skipping over equipping. They're just trying to create some elite society rather than doing the function of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. <laughs> but when we, that came off harsher than I meant, but, <laughs> but the goal of equipping is maturity. And of course, in Ephesians chapter two, uh, 4, and 13, it says, till we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ that will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. The Father has such a heart for you to mature in the prophetic. He has such a heart for, for his body to grow in this and not to treat a prophet as if, 
as if he is a mediator between you and God. The church is still suffering from covenant confusion. As if you still need someone to hear God for you. In the Old Testament, prophets hear God for us. In the New Testament, they hear God with us. They empower us all to help recognize and respond how God is speaking to his body. How God is speaking to the saints. In conference culture, sometimes we get addicted to the atmosphere of someone else's breakthrough. And we become like King Saul, who can prophesy when the prophets are around. Who can worship when a David is around. Who can pray and obey when someone's setting the structure for him. That's not maturity. It's time that the body of Christ quit surfing off of other people's grace and other people's anointing and realize that that grace and that anointing is only to show what is available to you in Christ Jesus. That Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And I'm, I'm a little bit weary right now, to be honest with you. I'm a little bit weary of people who want to predict the future rather than partner to create one. God has made his saints partners in his story. And too many Christians are living as if they're the victim of a timeline that's already been written. I want you to know you've been invited into his story. You've been invited into create history. There are absolutes on the timeline of God. Absolutely, there are. But there is more writable material than there is absolutes. There's more writable material than there is absolutes. God lets every believer set the boundaries of their own breakthrough. You're currently moving at the speed of your own obedience. However long it takes you to recognize that God is speaking and respond, that's the rate of your acceleration. See, if you need three prophecies, five scriptures, and the clock to say five, 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 three times <laughs> before you move, there's nothing wrong with that. Just don't complain about your rate of acceleration. You want to move faster? Obey faster. We don't really understand the mountain we're on. We don't understand the mountain we're on. Too many believers concerning the prophetic are still living on Mount Horeb. Deuteronomy 18:16 For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Mount Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, "Let us not hear the voice of the Lord." Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God. Let us not see this great fire anymore or we will die. And they said, here, Lord, you're too scary for us. Speak to Mo. Mo will go into the glow. And he will tell us what to do. Did you know a mediator prophet was man's idea, not God's idea? God invited everyone up the mountain. God 
invited everyone to hear his voice and to see his face. And they became afraid. They applied the fear of the Lord in the wrong way. And so they created a mediator between God and man. And God allowed it so that it could point to the coming Messiah. God allowed it for a time. That it could point to the actual mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. But now there remains one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus. And I, I'm afraid that too many prophets are making themselves mediators on behalf of God. Listen, we're reconcilers, not mediators. We're connecting people with how they see, how they hear, how they sense, how they perceive the voice of God. We are reconciling them to God. We are not the mediator. I am not hearing God for you, but I'll hear God with you. What mountain are you on? What mountain have you come to? Hebrews 12. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and the storm. To a trumpet blast to, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word would be spoken to them because they couldn't bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion. You've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Ha <laughs> ha. To the church of the firstborn, to the church of the prototype of the person, Jesus Christ. Whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. See to it that you don't refuse him who speaks to you personally. We are living in a day, I know in America we're very concerned about our elections, but do you realize that more government elections are happening this year globally than any time in history? The nations are being turned over right now, like no time in history. It's never been like this before. And can I encourage you in one thing? Don't forget the power of one person filled with the fullness of God. I, people are saying, prophet, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And I want to say to you, you will decide. <laughs> Listen, even in the old covenant, Moses stood on the hillside and held his hands up. He wasn't predicting the future. He was causing the future. One man standing in the battle between God's army and the enemy armies. One man standing there. And he was not predicting the future. He was partnering with heaven to release the future. To release God's purpose in the earth. And as long as his hands were up, the nation was winning, and when his hands went down, they were losing. And he needed people to come alongside and help hold up his hands. I'm telling you that God is not looking for a prophet to predict the future. God is looking for a partner to cause the future, who will hold their hands up over a nation in the valley of decision and see God's purposes released. One mediator. Jesus. One mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. James. James chapter 5. 
says Elijah was a man, a human, just like you. Just like you. And he prayed, and it rained not upon the land for two and a half years. And then he prayed again, and God opened up the heavens. What is the focus of that prayer? What is the focus of that passage? It's that one person filled with the Spirit of God can affect the economy and the ecology of their nation. It, it, it wasn't a matter of predicting the future. It was a matter of causing the future. It was a matter of partnering with the heart of heaven to release the purposes of God in the earth. And I believe we're standing at a time where God even has his hand over the future. And it's actually an act of kindness. So that sons and daughters will get the idea that, yes, there are absolutes that have been established, but there's a bunch of writable material in between. And he's looking for partners who believe that Elijah was a man just like us. He's looking for partners who will believe that one person with their hands in the air can not only predict the future, but cause the future, change the future. The heart of the Father is so strong on prophetic partnership right now. And it's an act of maturity to quit surfing the wave of grace and personally appropriate it. Don't become, please keep getting trained. Please keep attending. But don't become a conference junkie who is surfing off the grace of someone else's breakthrough. You've got to personally embrace the grace that's in the room and appropriate the authority attached with it. I believe we're living in a season where, where we've gone from the Elijah portion to the Elisha portion, and now we're facing a Gehazi generation. Elisha had twice as much as Elijah. He did every miracle that Elijah did, but he also did things that Elijah never did. This is the promise of Jesus, the same things that I did. You will do, and even greater things, because I go to the Father. But it's always in the third generation that the greatest challenge comes. Because that is where we move from multiplication to exponential increase. And the greatest battle is over that third generation. And, and, and that's what Gehazi faced. And Elisha says to his servant Gehazi, he says, Take my staff and go lay it on the boy who is dead and he'll come to life. The scripture doesn't say this, but I believe this is what happened according to many other passages and, and much long research. I believe that God wanted to raise the boy with the staff. I know that later Elisha goes and lays face to face and, and mouth to mouth on, on this young boy and he comes back to life. But I believe what happened is Elisha was saying to Gehazi, here's my authority. The staff, the representation of the authority. He said, here's my authority. Take my authority and go raise the child from the dead. And, and he's just doing it as an act of obedience, not as an act of personal appropriation. Later on, the same thing happens with, with uh, the king of Israel. He comes to Elisha and he says code words. The code words... My father, my father, the horses of Israel and the chariots thereof. Now, you have to understand the prophetic code. In prophetic code, that means, dude, you're about to die, and I want your anointing. <laughs> That's what it means. Because those are the words that Elisha spoke over Elijah when he received the double portion mantle. And so... It says Elisha was suffering from a sickness from which he died. And the king of Israel came to him and he said, My father, my father, the horses of Israel and the chariots thereof. The words that Elisha spoke over Elijah. And Elisha caught on. He knew what, it, what he was saying. He's like, okay, see this arrow? This arrow is the Lord's victory. The arrow of the Lord's victory. He goes, now open the east window. 
And he opens the east window and then the prophet puts his arm on the arms of the king and they shoot the aerial arrow out the window and he goes, see that? That is victory over Aphek. And he goes, now take the arrows in your hand and strike the ground. And he strikes tick, tick, tick three times. And Elisha becomes so angry. He said, you should have struck it seven times. Then you would have had total victory. Now you'll have just partial victory. How is he supposed to know? See, here's the key. When, when Elisha said to Elijah, uh, I want a double portion of what you carry. Elijah answered, if you see me when I go, then you'll have what you've asked. And we know that part of that was that he literally did not leave Elijah's side. He, he saw him when he was took up, when he was taken up into glory. But some of the ancient rabbis interpret that phrase a little bit different than how we see it. They interpreted it this way. They said, if you see the way that I see, you can have what I have. If you see the way I see when I go, then you can have what I have. There was an appropriation of the revelation and the authority that was on Elijah that Elisha walked with him and served him until he saw the way that Elijah saw so that he could have what Elijah had. And then he takes the mantle and what does he do? He appropriates it. Where is the God of Elijah? And he strikes the waters and they open. This is an hour where prophetic maturity requires personal appropriation. I don't want you to hear what I see. I want you to see what I see so you can have what I have. The call of the fivefold is for the equipping of the saints so that we can all see and we can all hear so that we can all partner with heaven. So I want to share five quick things about prophetic maturity. Um, and, and, and what I believe the Lord's taken us through right now, the first is this, the first mark of prophetic maturity is to embrace the grace available to you to see and to hear. Uh, again, our, our co-founder, Bethany Hicks, has written an incredible book on this called The God Connection. How you have... 12 spiritual receptors that help you recognize and respond to the voice of God. Check it out. It's really powerful. But again, the first step is the personal appropriation. You know, I had a prophet friend uh, in England who worked with Parliament. One of the things he said, he said, Dano, I often see clouds of favor, authority, gifting, hovering over people's heads. And I said, really, that's cool. I go, why is it hovering over their heads? And he said, it's awaiting a declaration of responsibility. <laughs> I've got four children and six grandchildren. Uh, my oldest is 37 and my youngest is 18. Uh, as far as my children. People always ask me, oh, that last one, was she a surprise? I'm like, no. The third one was a surprise. The fourth one was a shock. We, <laughs> we cried for a month, to be honest with you, because we were just getting to the place where my wife could travel with me, and, and we were grounded again. And, uh, but we had three boys, and then we had this lovely girl, and she graduated this week. Hallelujah. By the grace of God and the no child left behind policy of a former government. <laughs> I never realized how graduation was such a community sport. <laughs> but when she turned 18, she's like, I'm an adult. I'm mature. <laughs> Ready to go to college, Dad. 
I'm like, well, you're probably going to have to make your own sandwich first. <laughs> Maybe pay a bill. I don't even care which one. Just choose a bill of any type and pay it. Save money beyond one week. I dare you. Why? Because we know the mark of maturity is not seniority. The mark of maturity is responsibility. How many clouds of destiny, gifting, anointing are hanging over people's heads in this room because you've never made a declaration of responsibility? I stood in India 20-some years ago saying, Lord, 1.5 billion people who don't know you. What can we do? What can we do? Standing in leper colonies of hundreds and hundreds of people that was like a zombie apocalypse, to be honest with you. People rushing towards you with parts of their face and hands missing and, and begging for money and begging for help by the thousands. And you're right in the center of it. And you're just thinking, wow, I mean... I've seen incredible miracles, incredible power, but the needs just in this place. And, but I just, the leading of the Lord, take responsibility for revival in this nation. And I'm like, all right, Lord, I make a 10 year commitment to seeing revival happen in this nation. And we, raised up a prophetic band that began to sing the song of the Lord over their people group. And that band, we saw 1.2 million people come to Jesus. 1.2 million people. Prophetic maturity is, is taking responsibility for your ability to see. Your ability to hear, your, your ability to sense, your ability to perceive. It's embracing the grace and appropriating the authority of the prophetic personally in your life. Because God's looking for partners right now. God's looking for causative partners to shape the future that's in his heart. The second mark of maturity is testing and judging prophetic words. <laughs> Every error in history has been, it, regarding the prophetic, has been a lack of testing and judging the prophetic. Every, every error in prophetic history. And with the recent apocalypse, You know, I, I live in Austin now, and it's in the pathway of totality. And, and the, I've been living in the pathway of totality of the finished works of the cross already. I've been, living it, I've been living eclipsed by the love of Jesus for way too long to worry about some sunshine. But the prophets went crazy with it. The prophets. And I knew they would. I mean... You see it coming if you live through Y2K and other things. You know, every time there's a weather pattern, somebody's going somebody's to gonna draw their own conclusions and, and try to predict things forward according to the signs of the time. I want to say this. Until you've embraced the signs in the believer, you can't rightly interpret the signs of the times. Because G, uh, the scripture says... That in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. So before you can interpret the signs in the heavens and the earth, you have to embrace the sign in the believer that every son and daughter of God would would have prophetic abilities. Otherwise, you can't interpret the signs of the times. But I think what we've lost is, again, we don't understand. It's It's more of the covenant confusion We think that we're still living in a covenant where we are to, you know, judge the prophet as a true prophet or a false prophet according to their word, 
We're actually in the Ark Covenant, we're not judging the prophet, we're judging the prophecy. And the reason we can judge the prophecy is because the same spirit of prophecy is the Holy Spirit inside of us. And so we've lost the idea that there's two powerful people in any prophetic exchange. There's the person who is filled with the Spirit and sharing what they're seeing and hearing the Father saying. And then there's the receiver of the Word who's filled with the same Holy Spirit that is either saying amen or "Uh uh-uh to what's going on inside of you. What's going on through that prophetic word? And it is that prophetic maturity is not just a place where everybody can prophesy. Prophetic maturity is a place where everybody tests and judges the prophecy. And And how do we judge it? We judge it by scripture. Of course, no prophecy will ever counter the written word of God. No prophecy will violate the character and nature of God. Every prophecy should resonate with you personally. If, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit and this word is from the Holy Spirit, there should be an amen inside of you, even if it's, even if it's too awesome to believe, too big, too glorious, too frightening. There's still that sense of this is the word of the Lord and that personal resonance, that personal witness, how his spirit testifies with our spirit. And then finally, there's the test of community, that a directional word should always be able to stand the test of loved ones and leaders. You know, the violation of not testing a word uh, with loved ones and leaders, we see so much in the life of King Nebuchadnezzar. He has a prophetic dream about a statue with a head of gold, shoulder of silver, chest of bronze, and legs of iron and clay. And and he goes to Daniel for the interpretation. And and Daniel, by the Holy Spirit, has the gift of interpretation, tells him the dream, what it means. Hey, these are four kingdoms. You're the first king. You are the head of gold. He's made you the sovereign ruler. And uh, all all this incredible stuff. The other three are three kingdoms to come. It was a right interpretation. And then what does he do? He goes out and builds a 90-foot gold statue to himself and kills everybody who doesn't bow down to it. Right word, right interpretation. Really wish he had checked the application. <laughs> like, hey, this is the word I heard. This is what I think it means. And this is what I'm thinking about doing. How does that sound to you? Listen, the scripture says nobody goes to battle without first checking with their generals. Nobody builds a building without first getting advice. And yet, we're trying to build something off prophetic words that have not really been adequately judged. And we have this kind of like public panic that happens every time the prophets go crazy. And, and where are the people that are judging these words? Where are the two or three that are weighing carefully what has been said? Why are we acting like people are supposed to hear God for us rather than with us? What does Holy Spirit in you say? Not what does fear say. Not what does first heaven say. Not at what are the plans of second heaven. What is third heaven saying into the situation right now? That's prophecy. I'm so tired of hearing first heaven and second heaven reflections stated as prophecy. God always has a plan. God always has a purpose. So we need to test and judge. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, of course, it says, do not quench the Holy Spirit and do not despise prophetic utterances, but rather test all things and hold on to that which is good. Reject every kind of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 22. Such an important scripture right now. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. The way we don't quench is by not despising prophecy. But listen, right now there's a whole bunch of people who believed in prophecy that are currently despising prophecy because of how others have managed prophecy, not knowing that you mismanaged it too because you didn't judge it. 
You were disappointed because you didn't test. And now you're despising prophecy, which is quenching the Holy Spirit, rather than appropriating your authority as a believer to test and to judge everything that's been spoken, to hold on to what is good, and to reject all that is evil. I'm telling you, this prophetic move is going to decay if we don't mature enough to test and to judge prophecy. If we don't believe we are powerful to judge that same Holy Spirit that's speaking through that brother or sister is the same Holy Spirit that's witnessing inside of me to test and judge this word. And again, we test and we judge in community because we all have lenses. We all have lenses that affect how we're seeing, what we're seeing, what we're hearing. And so community is important to that function. And, and I, I just see so many people that are despising prophecy and quenching the Holy Spirit, and they don't realize that it's because they did not test and judge what was spoken. Yeah. Prophetic maturity. Are you okay? I, I don't want it to be heavy. I want it to be wonderful. I want it to be a partnership. I, I want you to understand how much of the fullness of Christ you've been given. <laughs> I, I, I want you to know that God didn't pour out his spirit on all flesh so we could have a bless me club. He poured out his spirit on all flesh so that we could partner in purposes that eye has not seen and ear has not heard and neither has it entered the thoughts of man, but he's revealed it to us who love him. He's revealed it to us to partner with in the earth. Number three, the third mark of, of prophetic maturity is mobilizing the prophetic. It's not just testing and judging. There is a mobilization that needs to happen. And um, I think sometimes we're so afraid of presumption that we don't partner with a word. We're so afraid of stepping out in our own power and energy that we are not really aligning and appropriating the words. But in 1 Timothy 1.18, the, the text that the Good Fight Processing book is written upon, it says, Timothy, my son, I urge you according to the prophetic words spoken over you that by following them, you might fight the good fight. And that phrase, fight the good fight, is the Greek word strategia. Sounds like our word strategy, formulate a strategy. It actually means to enlist in a military campaign. See, there is a way that you can align yourself with words, with prophetic words, that causes heaven's militia to be released on your behalf. I was in a service and I had been having this experience where often in worship, we would hear heavenly instruments and we would hear heavenly voices. And I was in this meeting with a very prophetic worship leader and I, I said, Lord, let the congregation hear the angels tonight. And then the Lord said something shocking. He said, they're more excited to hear you sing than you are to hear them sing. And I said, what? He said, the angels are more excited to hear you sing than you are to hear their sing, them sing. And I said, why would that be? And he said, because when you sing with revelation, they get commissioned. They get assignments. They hang around worship waiting to see if somebody actually understands what they're doing so that they can be commissioned on behalf of what you're singing. Those who are not just acknowledging attributes when they're worshiping, but accessing the attributes and distributing them, appropriating them in the spirit. There's a mobilization that is required with prophetic word. There is a formulation of strategy. There is a heavenly partnership that God is inviting you into. And uh, we have so much more on this, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just keep moving on. Uh, the fourth mark of, ma of prophetic maturity is what Haley spoke of yesterday. It's the training and exercise. From Hebrews 5.14, strong food is for the mature who by reason of practice, 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 have trained, gymnasoed their senses to discern both good and evil. Again, maturity does not happen by seniority. 
Maturity happens by obedience. It happens by instruction. It happens by practice. It happens by taking your, your beliefs to the spiritual gym and giving them a workout. I'm tired of people saying they believe in the resurrection who've never prayed for a dead person. Your beliefs are not your faith. As a matter of fact, many of your beliefs are just your spiritual fantasies. Your beliefs become your faith when you put them into practice because faith without works is dead. And when we think that what we believe is actually our faith, then we're deceived. We're deceived. We're hearers of the word but not doers. So what do you do if you believe in resurrection... Just start. I don't care if it's a house plant. I don't care if it's roadkill. I, I don't care where you start. Just start. Dead people are the easiest to pray for of anybody. I'm telling you. We were in Krasnodarsk, Siberia, and we had three resurrections in 24 hours. Because we're, we don't just believe in the centrality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe that he is the resurrection and the life. And the same way that he is Jehovah Rapha to minister the power of healing through the believer. He is the resurrection and the life to release the power of resurrection through the believer. If we'll just put it into play. There is a mobilization required. It's not just testing and judging a word. It's then partnering with that word, aligning with that word, and appropriating the power and the authority of that word strategically in your life. That's the prophetic maturity that the Father's looking for, that we put things into practice. And finally, the fifth mark of prophetic maturity is the revelation of Jesus. <laughs> Prophecy is the revelation of the person of Jesus. Do you realize that when I'm prophesying over you, I'm actually just describing what Christ looks like in you? I'm not describing you. I'm revealing Jesus in you. I'm revealing what flavor and fragrance of Jesus you uniquely carry. I'm not speaking into your identity and destiny in one sense because you died and your life is now hidden in Jesus Christ. I'm describing what does this new creation, this resurrected man, what does the Christ life look like through you? And I think there's this error that the greatest prophets are those that can tell us what's coming next. No, the greatest prophets are those who can tell us who's coming next. The Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory. The revelation of Jesus is the ultimate purpose of prophecy. Come on, the book of Revelation is not the revelation of the end times. The book of Revelation is the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. In the first four chapters, there's 90 descriptions of Jesus. In the first four chapters, there's 90 descriptions of Jesus. And every one of them is an invitation to an encounter. And guys... We're so function-oriented and so relationally dysfunctional that we want everybody to tell us what. And we want everybody to tell us how. But I'm telling you, the greatest prophetic revelation, the greatest expression of prophetic maturity is who Jesus wants to be for you right now. How he wants to reveal himself. How he wants to show himself to you. And what if prophets were less focused on the details of some timeline as if we're victims of a pre-written story. You're partners of a story. You're partners of a story. And what you need to fulfill that purpose is the revelation of Jesus that's going to unlock it. That's why we need to keep growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the knowledge of who Jesus wants to be for you is the master key of the kingdom that unlocks the measures of fullness 
of the person of Christ inside of you. And what if, what if the voice of the prophets were committed to the revelation of Jesus? What if, what if we were encircling the throne like the four living creatures just beholding the glory of who he is? What if we were continuously seeing new things about who he wanted to be? See, returning to the book of Revelations, there's seven churches that have seven letters. Some of these churches are only 20 miles apart. But they have different messages because they have different revelations of Jesus. To one, he wants to be the faithful and true. To one, he wants to be the one who holds the keys of David, who opens the doors that no one can shut and shuts the doors that no one can open. See, even though these churches and these cities were just not far apart geographically, each one had a personal revelation of Jesus. God was showing himself differently to the different churches of that age. And I'm telling you that the greatest expression of prophetic maturity is not to predict the future. It is to partner in creating the future, but greater than that is to reveal who Jesus wants to be for us. How are we to know him in this season? Because every way you know him, every way you behold him will get unlocked inside of you. And in this way, we'll move from glory to glory with ever increasing glory by beholding the one. The ability to see I don't want to see the future if I don't see you. I don't want to see what's going to happen if I don't know who he wants to be in the midst of that. How he wants to show himself. How he wants to demonstrate himself. And I honestly, I have this dream in my heart. What if we had a whole generation of prophetic people that knew that they could hear and see? What if we had a whole generation of prophetic people who knew that it didn't take a stadium of people praying to shift a nation, but maybe just one person with their hands up? What if we had a whole generation of people that were not playing the victims of prophetic destiny, but, but, but they were actually judging the word and testing the word? What if we had a generation of people who knew how to mobilize the word and fight the good fight according to the prophecies that's were spoken over us like Randy spoke of in the first session. And what if, what if a whole prophetic generation was focused on beholding him and revealing who he wanted to be to each one of us? What if we understood that when somebody's prophesying over me, they're actually prophesying over Christ in me? What he looks like. What he, how he wants to express himself. What is the flavor and the fragrance of Jesus? Can you see it? Because if we, if we could see it, we could have it. If you could see what I could see. If, if you can hear what I'm saying with your heart, not just with your ears. You're already this. Just appropriate it. Just take it. Just drink it. Just believe it. Just align and appropriate with what the Lord is saying. Listen, the purpose of the cross was not forgiveness. Christ died to forgive you of sin so he could free you from the power of sin so he could fill you with the fullness of God. The purpose was always fullness. He wanted to fill every believer with what fills God himself. And now he's looking for prophetic people and apostolic people. People build on that apostolic prophetic foundation that are bold enough to believe it and to step out and appropriate in the power and the glory of who Jesus wants to be in his church in this hour. Let's pray. You're so good, Lord. You're so generous. Oh my goodness. We are so blessed to have such a wealth of apostolic and prophetic wisdom and understanding and insight. Lord, we are so blessed to have a grace to do miracles and signs and wonders and to receive strategies for cities and nations and solutions for problems. Lord, you are so generous. You are so generous with your spirit. You're so generous 
with your fullness. Father, I, I pray that we could be the kind of community together that would mature. That we'd quit being tossed about like infants and tossed about like the waves of the sea as if we didn't have a plumb line. As if we didn't have the Holy Spirit in us. Lord, I pray that there would be a maturing. There would be a responsibility. There would be an adulting that would happen in the prophetic movement. There would be a shift that would align with the dream of your heart and people would begin to partner to release the potentials in history. <sighs> Holy Spirit, thank you for just tutoring us in these things and for the incredible graciousness of the cross and your love. We give you thanks. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn it over here in just a second, but I just, I just want to say, if you kind of felt like you have been more living the victim side of other people's prophecies, or you've been kind of being tossed around by that, I don't want to embarrass you in any way, but I feel like we could probably do something right now that would be catalytic to a new mindset. You know, repentance is more than a tear and a, I'm sorry. It's a change. It's a renewing of the mind in Christ Jesus. And if you found yourself a bit tossed by the prophetic, a bit offended by how the prophetic has happened, or a bit scared of what people are saying or whatever, and, and you're just realizing, oh man, I have not been like appropriating my own. I've not been appropriating my my own testing and judging, or, and, and it's kind of caused this a little bit of funk or a little bit of fear, that kind of thing. I feel like we could break it right now with a simple prophetic act. So if that's you and you've got the courage to do it, I just want you to stand to your feet, and I'm just going to release a prayer uh, over you as you just personally appropriate your authority in Christ Jesus. So Father, I thank you. We are your sons and daughters, and you poured out your spirit on all flesh so every son and daughter can prophesy. And so now we appropriate our authority as a son and daughter in Christ Jesus. Our authority to see and to hear, to test and to judge, to mobilize the prophetic word, Lord, and to reveal the beauty of who you are in Jesus' name. Heal our hearts and renew our minds after your word and your delight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's just thank him together. Praise the Lord.